Hello. Today I will discuss the biological basis of alternate bearing. Today I will discuss a model of alternate bearing in pecans and the biological basis of alternate bearing. Dr. Woods at the USDA in Georgia proposed a model explaining initiation of flowering in pecans. Although developed for pecans, it is likely re relevant to many alternate bearing species. He proposed three sequential phases that control pistillate flower initiation in, in pecan. They include one, a foliage produced phloem translocated florigen acting to signal floral initiation. Two, translocated phytohormones such as auxins, cytokinins, and gibberellins from foliage and or fruit to the developing buds. And three, the concentration of non-structural carbohydrates such as sucrose acting as a third level signal enabling floral development. Thus plant growth regulators and carbohydrate levels are both involved in alternate bearing. As mentioned in the previous slide, both plant growth regulators and carbohydrates are likely involved in alternate bearing. First, I would like to discuss the carbohydrate competition. What this says is there is a competition for resources such that carbohydrates are used for food growth at the expense of flower initiation and development. Another factor is plant growth regulators. The developing seeds produce plant growth regulators and or other chemical inhibitors which interfere with floral initiation and return bloom. Chan and Kane in a classic research paper indicated the importance of plant growth regulators. They used a facultative parthenocarpic apple cultivar called Spencer seedless, which could therefore set fruit with seed following pollinization and fertilization, or could set seedless fruit parthenocarpically. Parthenocarpically means seedless fruit developed despite the lack of pollinization and fertilization. Here are some parthenocarpic fruit. Watermelon, citrus, and banana are all parthenocarpic. As well as this tomato here at left. After developing the two populations of fruit, both seeded and seedless, they studied the relationship between seed number on the fruiting spur and the return bloom on those same spurs the subsequent year. Here we have a, a seedless fruit and a developing spur for next year's fruit production. And here we have a seeded fruit. First, they set up three different spur types. The spur types in the previous year were either seedless fruit, seeded fruit, or no fruit. Then they looked at the percent spurs flowering the following year. In seedless fruit and no fruit, almost 100% of the spurs flowered the subsequent year, as we can see in this table. However, the spurs that bore seeded fruit the previous year, only 13% of the spurs flowered. The interpretation is that the demand for carbohydrates are similar between seeded and seedless fruit. There are very few seeds in apples and they don't have a huge carbohydrate demand. They concluded that substances diffusing from the seed to the spur inhibited flower initiation and return bloom. These substances are likely auxins and gibberellins. Substances produced in the seed were moving down and inhibiting flowering in the spur the following year. Here is a recent study that indicates gibberellin's role in alternate bearing. Bruce Woods applied prohexadone calcium, which is a metabolic inhibitor of gibberellin synthesis, to on-phase trees 
at the pre-kerneling stage in mid-July and then to another set of trees at a post-kerneling stage in mid-August. Applying the chemicals pre-kerneling increased return bloom in the next off-phase year, as can be seen by the graph. However, if the gibberellin inhibitor is applied after kernel filling in mid-August, there is no effect on the next year's pistillate flower crop. These data indicate that gibberellin activity early in the season can inhibit bloom the next year. Similar to apple and pecan, in pear, auxins and gibberellins in seed can inhibit bloom the following year. However, these data indicate that increased leaf area per fruit can overcome some of the inhibition caused by the seed. Here is a table looking at the influence of leaf to fruit ratio on return bloom in Bartlett pear. He did this with spurs that bore fruit and spurs that did not bear fruit. Then he looked at the percent spurs carrying flowers the following second year. What we see is that if the number of spur leaves was 9 or 10 the previous year, then many spurs flowered the following year, both on spurs that bore fruit and did not bear fruit the previous year, thus increasing the amount of carbohydrates available to flower buds can increase flowering the next year. Lack of carbohydrates may also initiate alternate bearing. Here is a schematic showing the process during an on and off year. During the on year, there is a heavy fruit load which causes carbohydrate stress, which leads to root starvation, mineral deficiencies, hormonal imbalances, and can lead to tree collapse, as in the case of Mercant tangerine. All these processes inhibit flower bud differentiation and thus produce an off year, as we have here. And that year is a year of repair and recovery, and then you're back into a heavy fruit load the next on year. Here is the only branch that is fruiting on this pistachio tree. In off, lightly cropping years, a few branches are on a different cycle. This suggests that there is some degree of branch autonomy in pistachio. The principle of branch autonomy states that the critical characteristics of a branch's carbohydrate economy, photosynthesis, respiration, growth, etc., are largely independent of the tree to which the branch is attached. But what I want to focus on are these buds here in this circle that are close to the developing fruit. These buds fall off or upsize as the fruit mature here. Fruit buds are born on one-year-old wood. Here we have a fruiting and non-fruiting branch. If we remove the leaves, this is what the branch looks like. Note that on the non-fruiting branch, next year's flower buds are present in the leaf axles, where on the fruiting branch there are no flower buds on, in the leaf axles. Thus, no flowers or fruit will be produced on this branch the next year. Here is another picture of a fruiting branch and a non-fruiting branch. Note the fruiting buds have fallen off in the fruiting branch, whereas they're present in the non-fruiting branch. Here are some curves depicting the influence of developing seeds on retention and growth of inflorescence buds. If the branch is defruited, about 85% of the buds remain on the branch, as shown in the top graph. On a fruiting branch, the buds fall off linearly over time as the seed matures. Also, buds from fruiting branches weigh less than buds from defruited branches as we can see in this graph. Here is a close-up of the fruiting and non-fruiting branch. Again, note the lack of flower buds on the fruiting branch versus the non-fruiting branch. The fruit branch did have flower buds on the branch, but over the season they fell off. Competition for carbohydrates between the fruit and developing buds likely played a role in this bud abscission. All the carbohydrates are going to the fruit, the buds are starved and fall off. 
This situation then results in alternate bearing. Here is a schematic of a bearing branch. In a classic paper, researchers applied radioactive carbon dioxide, C14, to the leaves in fruiting and non-fruiting branches, and then looked at the amount of radioactivity, carbon-14, that was in the buds subtending the leaves, in these buds right here. They applied the radioactive carbon dioxide on three dates to fruiting and non-fruiting branches. The data indicate that about two times as much radioactivity was found in the buds of defruited branches versus the fruiting branches on all dates measured, as we can see. And this is in, or counts per minute per bud, on all three dates. Thus, the buds on fruiting branches were receiving less carbohydrates. The interpretation of the study was that there was a competition for carbohydrates between fruits and buds. Buds received less carbohydrates and consequently fell off. In summary, research indicates both plant growth regulators such as auxins, gibberellins, and cytokinins, and maybe others produced by the seed are involved in alternate bearing. In addition, carbohydrate levels also influence alternate bearing. Thank you.